Peter Bell, at Hale, part first, William Wordsworth, part first, all by the moonlight riverside groaned the poor beast alas. In vain. The staff was raised to loftier height, and the blows fell with heavier weight as Peter struck and struck again. Amperson quo. Hold. Amperson quo. Cried the squire, Amperson quo. Against the rules of common sense you're surely sinning. This leap is for us all too bold. Who Peter was, let that be told, and start from the beginning. Amperson quo. Amperson quo. A potter, sir, he was by trade. Amperson quo. Said I, becoming quite collected. Amperson quo. And wheresoever he appeared, full twenty times was Peter feared for once that Peter was respected. Amperson quo. He, two and thirty years or more, had been a wild and woodland rover. Had heard the Atlantic surges roar on farthest Cornwall's rocky shore, and trod the cliffs of Dover. Amperson quo. And he had seen Carnarvon's towers, and well he knew the spire of Sarum. And he had been where Lincoln Bell flings o'er the fen that ponderous Nellifar renowned Alarum. Amperson quo. At Doncaster, at York, and Leeds, and Mary Carlyle had be been. And all along the lowlands fair, all through the bonny shire of Ayr and far as Aberdeen. Amperson quo. And he had been at Inverness. And Peter, by the mountain rills, had danced his round with highland lasses. And he had lain beside his asses on lofty Cheviot hills, Amperson quo. And he had trudged through Yorkshire dells, among the rocks and winding scars, where deep and low the hamlets lie beneath their little patch of sky and little lot of stars, Amperson quo. And all along the indented coast, bespattered with the salt sea foam, where e'er a knot of houses lay on headland, or in hollow bay. Sure never man like him did roam. Amperson quo. As well might Peter, in the fleet, have been fast bound, a begging debtor. He travelled here, he travelled there, but not the value of a hair was heart or head the better. Amperson quo. He roved among the vales and streams, in the green wood and hollow dell. They were his dwellings night and day, but nature ne'er could find the way into the heart of Peter Bell. Amperson quo. In vain, through every changeful year, did nature lead him as before. A primrose by a river's brim a yellow primrose was to him, and it was nothing more. Amperson quo. Small change it made on Peter's heart to see his gentle pioneer train with more than vernal pleasure feeding, where e'er the tender grass was leading its earliest green along the lane. Amperson quo. In vain, through water, earth, and air, the soul of happy sound was spread, when Peter on some April morn, beneath the broom or budding thorn, made the warm earth his lazy bed. Amperson quo. At noon, when, by the forest sedge he lay beneath the branches high, the soft blue shy did never melt into his heart. He never felt the witchery of the soft blue sky. Amperson quo. On a fair prospect some have looked and felt, as I have heard them say, as if the moving time had been a thing as steadfast as the scene on which they gazed themselves away. Amperson quo. Within the breast of Peter Bell these silent raptures found no place. He was a carl as wild and rude as ever hue and cry pursued, as ever ran a felon's race. Amperson quo. Of all that led a lawless life, of all that loved their lawless lives, in city or in village small, he was the wildest far of all. He had a dozen wedded wives. Amperson quo. Nay, start not. Wedded wives and twelve. But how one wife could he e'er come near him, in simple truth I cannot tell. For, be it said of Peter Bell to see him was to fear him. Amperson quo. Though nature could not touch his heart by lovely forms, and silent weather, and tender sounds, yet you might see at once, that Peter Bell and she had often been together. Amperson quo. A savage wildness round him hung as if a dweller out of doors. And his whole figure and his mean a savage character was seen of mountains and of dreary moors. Amperson quo. To all the unshaped half-human thoughts which solitary nature feeds midsummer storms or winter's ice, had Peter joined whatever vice the cruel city breeds. Amperson quo. His face was keen as is the wind that cuts along the hawthorn fence. Of courage you saw little there, but, in its stead, a medley air of cunning and of impudence. 
Ampersand quo. He had a dark and sidelong walk, and long and slouching was his gait. Beneath his look so bare and bold, you might perceive, his spirit cold was playing with some inward bait. Ampersand quo. His forehead wrinkled was inferred. A work, one half of which was done by thinking of his whens and hows, and half, by knitting of his brows beneath the glaring sun. Ampersand quo. There was a hardness in his cheek, there was a hardness in his eye, as if the man had fixed his face, in many a solitary place, against the wind and open sky. Ampersand quo. One night, and now my little Bess. We've reached at last the promised hail, one beautiful November night, when the full moon was shining bright upon the rapid river swall, along the river's winding banks Peter was traveling all alone, whether to buy or sell, or led by pleasure running in his head, to me was never known. He trudged along through crops and brake, he trudged along o'er hill and dell. Nor for the moon cared he a tittle, and for the stars he cared as little, and for the murmuring river swall. But, chancing to SP a path that promised to cut short the way as many a wiser man hath done, he left a trusty guide for one that might his steps betray. To a thick wood he soon is brought where cheerily his course he weaves, and whistling loud may yet be heard, though often buried, like a bird darkling, among the boughs and leaves. But quickly Peter's mood is changed, and on he drives with cheeks that burn in downright fury and in wrath. There's little sign the treacherous path will to the road return. The path grows dim, and dimmer still. Now up, now down, the rover wends, with all the sail that he can carry, till brought to a deserted quarry and there the pathway ends. He paused for shadows of strange shape, massy and black, before him lay. But through the dark, and through the cold, and through the yawning fissures old, did Peter boldly press his way right through the quarry and behold a scene of soft and lovely hue, where blue and gray, and tender green, together make as sweet a scene as ever human eye did view. Beneath the clear blue sky he saw a little field of meadow ground. But field or meadow name it not. Call it of earth a small green plot, with rocks encompassed round, the swall flowed under the gray rocks, but he flowed quiet and unseen. You need a strong and stormy gale to bring the noises of the swall to that green spot so calm and green. And is there no indwelling here, no hermit with his beads and glass? And does no little cottage look upon this soft and fertile nook? Does no one live near this green grass? Across the deep and quiet spot is Peter driving through the grass and now has reached the skirting trees. When, turning round his head, he sees a solitary ass. Amperson quo. A prize. Amperson quo cries Peter but he first must spy about him far and near, there's not a single house in sight, no woodman's hut, no cottage light Peter, you need not fear. There's nothing to be seen but woods, and rocks that spread a hurry gleam, and this one beast, that from the bed of the green meadow hangs his head over the silent stream. His head is with the halter bound. The halter seizing, Peter leapt upon the creature's back, and plied with ready heels his shaggy side but still the ass's station kept. Then Peter gave a sudden jerk, a jerk that from a dungeon floor would have pulled up an iron ring. But still the heavy-headed thing stood just as he had stood before. Quoth Peter, leaping from his seat, Amperson quo. There is some plot against me laid. Amperson quo. Once more the little meadow ground and all the hoary cliffs around he cautiously surveyed, all, all as silent rocks and woods, all still and silent far and near. Only the ass, with motion dull, upon the pivot of his skull turns round his long left ear. Thought Peter, what can mean all this? Some ugly witchcraft must be here. Once more the ass, with motion dull, upon the pivot of his skull turned round his long left ear. Suspicion ripened into dread. Yet with deliberate action slow, his staff high raising, in the pride of skill, upon the sounding height, he dealt a sturdy blow. The poor ass staggered with the shock. And then, as if to take his ease, in quiet uncomplaining mood, upon the spot where he had stood, dropped gently down upon his knees, as gently on his side he fell. And by the river's brink did lie. And, while he lay like one that mourned, the patient beast on Peter turned his shining hazel eye. Twas but one mild, reproachful look, a look more tender than severe. And straight in sorrow, not in dread 
he turned the eyeball and his head towards the smooth river deep and clear. Upon the beast the sapling rings. His lank sides heaved, his limbs they stirred. He gave a groan, and then another, of that which went before the brother, and then he gave a third. All by the moonlight riverside he gave three miserable groans. And not till now hath Peter seen how gaunt the creature is, how lean and sharp his staring bones. With legs stretched out and stiff he lay, no word of kind commiseration fell at the side from Peter's tongue. With hard contempt his heart was wrung, with hatred and vexation. The meager beast lay still as death, and Peter's lips with fury quiver. Quoth he, Amperson quo. You little mellish dog, I'll fling your carcass like a log head foremost down the river. Amperson quo. An impious oath confirmed the threat whereat from the earth on which he lay to all the echoes, south and north, and east and west, the ass sent forth a long and clamorous bray. This outcry, on the heart of Peter, seems like a note of joy to strike, joy at the heart of Peter knocks. But in the echo of the rocks was something Peter did not like. Whether to cheer his coward breast, or that he could not break the chain, in the serene and solemn hour, twined round him by demoniac power, to the blind work he turned again. Among the rocks and winding crags. Among the mountains far away. Once more the ass did lengthen out more ruefully a deep-drawn shout, the hard dry sea saw of his horrible bray. What is there now in Peter's heart? Or whence the might of this strange sound? The moon uneasy looked and dimmer, the broad blue heavens appeared to glimmer, and the rocks staggered all around from Peter's hand the sapling dropped. Threat has he none to execute? Amperson quo. If any one should come and see that I am here, they'll think, Amperson quo. Quoth he, Amperson quo. I'm helping this poor dying brute. Amperson quo. He scans the ass from limb to limb, and ventures now to uplift his eyes. More steady looks the moon and clear more like themselves the rocks appear and touch more quiet skies. His scorn returns his hate revives. He stoops the ass's neck to seize with malice that again takes flight. For in the pool a startling sight meets him, among the inverted trees. Is it the moon's distorted face? The ghost-like image of a cloud? Is it a gallows there portrayed? Is Peter of himself afraid? Is it a coffin, or a shroud? A grisly idol hewn in stone? Or imp from which a slap let fall? Perhaps a ring of shining fairies? Such as pursue their feared vagaries in sylvan bower, or haunted hall? Is it a fiend that to a stake of fire his desperate self is tethering? Or stubborn spirit doomed to yell in solitary ward or cell, ten thousand miles from all his brethren? Never did pulse so quickly throb, and never heart so loudly panted. He looks, he cannot choose but look like someone reading in a book a book that is enchanted. Ah, well a day for Peter Bell. He will be turned to iron soon, meet statue for the court of fear. His hat is up and every hair bristles, and whitens in the moon. He looks, he ponders, looks again. He sees a motion hears a groan. His eyes will burst his heart will break he gives a loud and frightful shriek, and back he falls, as if his life were flown.